Middle Eastern high seas adventure, cool, let's do it. And I quickly begin to hate it. Quips do not equal wit. My tastes are not a good indication of majority opinion. So... The Adventures of Amina al Sarafi by Shannon Chakraborty. I think it's safe to say it was a pretty anticipated release. So my expectations going into it, I read City of Brass, uh, pretty around the time when it came out and I didn't get the hype uh, and I did not continue in that series. I continued ever since then to hear Chakra Boarding widely praised. I, it's made me think maybe I should continue the Dave Abad series but I was like eh, I didn't really like the first one so I don't know. There was massive hype about this book which was I believe her first non Dave Abad book. So her first thing she'd written after finishing the Dave Abad series. So there was massive hype from people who had loved the Dave Abad series and as far as what this book would be I knew that it was by Shannon Chakraborty. I knew that it would be about an older female protagonist. I knew that it would be a high seas adventure, which, you know, is clear from the cover. I knew that it would have Middle Eastern influence um, or inspiration. And I knew that it was adult fantasy. So in terms of expectations, I mean, they were decently high, but tempered because I hadn't loved her previous books um, or book. I only read City of Brass and you know, it, it vaguely sounded good. It sounded like it would be quite different from the Devabot trilogy. I, I guess I, I, my only expectation would be that, well, presumably she as a writer has improved or progressed or changed over time. So Devabod uh, or City of Brass was a, her debut, as far as I know. And this is, you know, her fourth book. So I guess I would expect to see some progress in writing ability or, so, or some, some such. But like, otherwise I didn't really have expectations per se. So my initial impression of the book at the outset did begin to form some expectations that I didn't have before, much to its detriment. So in the beginning of the book we have an author's note. It talks about, well I guess I can just read it to you, it's not very long, it's just this little paragraph. So the author's note says, please note that in the voice of the time and place in which this book takes place, the Latin Christians of Western Europe are referred to as Franks and the Byzantines as the Rum. The novel's 12th century largely Islamicate societies of the northwestern Indian Ocean literal had their own rich and fascinating way of describing antiquity, their contemporaries and the wider world. And though I've tried to recreate that here as accurately as possible, this is a work of fiction. A glossary with additional historical and nautical terms can be found at the back, as well as suggestions for further reading." So that sounds great. That's exactly the kind of author's note that I want to see. I, if this is going to be, or if any book is going to be, either historical fiction or historical fantasy, meaning that it is still taking place in our world and it is drawing, uh, it is intended to be taking place in a world that's recognizably a specific place and time in our real world history. I like an indication from the author that says they've done some research. They've made an effort to make it historically accurate as much as is possible. So we're told about these naming conventions. We're told that, you know, she's done her best to, to portray this time and place, 12th century Middle East, as accurately as possible, but it is fiction, so like to give it some grace. And I'm like, sure, you got it. You know, I don't expect it to be a documentary. Liberties will be taken, it's a fantasy. But it certainly sounds like this is going to be, again, heavily researched, and it's gonna ha make a pretty good effort to be historically accurate. Super excited to dive in. Like my expectations going in before reading the author's note, Middle Eastern high seas adventure, cool, let's do it. Reading the author's note, I was like, all right. This sounds like it's gonna be great. And that author's note was both the first and the last time that I was super excited about this book. Because as soon as we began reading the book, we open with soapboxing. We open with extremely modern ideas of feminism. We open with a quippy juvenile protagonist a la Marvel. We learn that there's gonna be these cutesy fourth wall breaks and I quickly begin to hate it. So why did I hate it? Besides everything that I just said. So I personally care a lot about historicity and historical verisimilitude. I was never gonna like this book. But rather than this simply not being my cup of tea, I was angered because my expectations were set so much higher because of the author's note. We had these opening remarks that led me to believe that I should expect a great deal of attention to historical accuracy and detail. Again, I would not like this book even without that author's note because I do care about that regardless. But to set up my expectations that, I, that I'm going to get that and then to not deliver it is so much worse. Any day without chips and guac is just objectively a worse day. But if you tell me I'm gonna get chips and guac and then I don't get it, it's even, it was way worse. Next, the style of the humor, again, absolutely does not work for me, which is extremely subjective. Quips do not equal wit. The main character and frankly, every other character had that exact same bland surface level, modern, 
juvenile, quippy, again, Marvel-esque style of humor, which again, does not work for me really ever. But it also, I find, really undermines the readers or viewers in the case of Marvel, ability to take a character or a situation or a plot or a story or anything seriously. Next, I think this book has a problem with telling over showing. We are told by Amina that Amina is a badass, that she is talented and daring, that she's an individual that's faced and overcome incredible odds, um, but we are not shown this. And I think it comes off as having a very similar problem to a lot of YA, which I complain about in YA and is one of the reasons I read much, much less YA now than I used to, is YA will have a character, a protagonist, that's an assassin, that's a thief, that's some kind of, you know, a criminal, some kind of a cool badass thing like that. But we can't root for the protagonist if they're really out here murdering people for money. So either they'll have killed some people off screen before the events of the book take place so we don't really ever have to deal with it, or everyone thinks they're killing people but really they're not, or they have very good reasons for killing people actually because they only kill the actual bad guys, never anyone that's good. And you know, if you're gonna have a main character that's a thief or a pirate or an assassin, then they're gonna have to be morally gray. They're gonna have to do some things that the reader might find reprehensible. Like, don't wimp out. Then if you're not okay with it, then, then don't make your protagonist an assassin, a pirate, a thief. And here I feel like that's what we got. Um, Amina, the main character, is a pirate. A pirate in the 12th century. A female pirate in the 12th century. A middle-aged female pirate in the 12th century who has supposedly carved a place for herself in this man's world. But she seems to be quite surprised anytime someone is cruel or callous or behaves in a way that is morally not great. She's unwilling to be party to anything immoral. It seems like she's like cosplaying pirate. She's like a CW pirate, not, you know, a real pirate. And I get that this is fantasy, but this is adult fantasy that I've been told by the author was heavily researched to get an authentic representation of 12th century Middle Eastern peoples and cultures and practices. And it promised me too that there was a glossary of historical terms and nautical terms. I mean, what 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 research was done? Because Amina, again, seems to balk at anything immoral, don't really see her do anything terribly badass, and we don't really see any high skill in seafaring. I frankly found Amina quite insufferable. I found her quippy banter got real old real fast. Her cockiness seemed really unearned. Again, see telling over showing. Her situation and predicaments, they felt oftentimes to be her fault through st stupidity and naivete. It seems hard to credit for a woman in her supposed position of having had to fight for this place for herself. I mean, if she's a respected and feared pirate in the 12th century, like, you know, I wouldn't expect her to be so naive and dumb. Much like myself, my camera overheated. So where was I? Um, yeah, she's not, um, believably a pirate. Which brings me to the seafaring element of this story, which again, the author's note, indicated I should expect research and accuracy in this as well. I mean, I'm not gonna call Shannon Chakraborty a liar, but I don't feel like any research whatsoever was done, at least in, in terms of the, the nautical side of things. At one point we were told that an older male relative of Amina's used to tell her stories of his exploits and adventures on the high seas, and that this is what enabled her to run off and run away and like, take up a life at sea for herself because she applied what she'd learned from his stories. Like, did his stories include meticulous detail as to like how to actually sail an, a ship, how to, how to run a ship? Because, I mean, I don't think those would have been very interesting stories, but if they didn't, I really failed to see how his stories of his life at sea would have enabled her realistically to sail a ship. Like, if this story was written more in the style of like um, an old legend, an old tale, you know, the way that um, the Winter Night trilogy uh, tries, it, it has kind of like old timey vibe. It feels more like a legend and fairy tale than like a novel. Or if it was written more like, I don't know, Song of Achilles or Circe, things like that, where there's a lot of sort of like fairy tale logic that's going on. In a fairy tale, in a legend, in a Homeric epic, to say that like, the hero like listened to tales of the seas and then went to the sea himself. Like that's the shape of the storytelling that I expect to see in something like this. But here, she's, it, it doesn't feel like an old legend or an old tale. She's literally telling you, oh yeah, grandpa used to tell me, I, I don't actually remember if it was her grandpa. I think it was her grandpa. She was like, yeah, grandpa used to tell me all of his stories of his, you know, 
days on the high seas. So I ran away and because I had, he told me all those stories that now I knew what to do and I could I could also live on the open ocean. And it's like, there's, there's just so many practical aspects to actually being at sea that I would imagine would not be included in a story if one is trying to entertain their audience. You know what I mean? That being the explanation for how Amina is able to go off and and go live at sea because like who would teach a girl you know how to how to sail but you know oh she had these stories so that's how she knew it's like but but no the sea and and seafaring and being on a ship and whatnot in this book it, it feels it's more of a means of getting from place to place not a site in itself for adventuring or altercation or cleverness i mean it doesn't do any super clever like nautical stuff or or any or anything like that i, I mean i am not an expert I've been on a boat like twice in my life. Maybe it might even legitimately be twice. Anyway, yeah, I don't claim to be an expert, but I certainly have read and watched a lot of books and movies and shows that do take place at sea. So like, I wouldn't be able to tell if it's correct or not, but I would be able to tell how much effort was put into like creating a scenario and telling me all these details about life at sea. Cool maneuvers to like outpace uh, an opponent who's on another ship or to be able to trick an attacker um, with some kind of, again, cool strategy, cool seafaring strategy. For example, uh, Horatio Hornblower is an all-time favorite of mine, and I love watching all the ways that Horatio is able to outsmart the enemy who's on another ship. And again, I, I have no idea if that's sound strategy or if what he's saying is actually what somebody on a ship would do. I kind of take for granted that it is. But there's like a lot of thought pot put into that, and that's what a lot of the story is about, is him being clever in in sailing. And there just simply isn't anything like that in this book. Like they're vaguely on a ship. They're on a ship the way that somebody on a soap opera or a CW show would be on a ship where there's just like vaguely a ship-like backdrop. You know what I mean? If research was done into like how ships were sailed in the 12th century and what strategies were employed by the sailors in getting from place to place and surviving and attacking, if any of that was researched I don't think that research made it into any part of this book. Which then brings me to historicity. And again, the vernacular, the attitudes, the social norms in this book are all incredibly modern. And do not tell me that you cannot tell a feminist story in a historical time period without making it anachronistically modernly feminist. That is not true. And if you're going to tell me that, oh, it's so fun that this book decided to fantasize about an alternate history where it was just super modern and feminist and whatever, well, it didn't. Because one, the author did tell us that, you know, research was done to make this feel authentically like the 12th century. I mean, apparently. But also this book tells us that this society is extremely patriarchal. It doesn't really show that, but Amina rails against the patriarchy all the time. So this isn't an alternate history where things just are kind of feminist and liberal. They're not. Because Amina gets to be mad about how they're not and how she stands out and how she's had to fight for her place because that's not something that a woman typically would be able or allowed to do. She would have no patriarchy to rail against if this is some alternate feminist version of history. There are examples in history of women and other historically marginalized and disenfranchised people being able to do things that defy the odds, that defy expectations, that defy what they what society would have said they were allowed to do. People that have carved places for themselves um, in ways that was not expected or permitted. And no, you don't have to limit yourself to telling true stories to only the people that did actually do those things and then, then you can tell that story because otherwise it would be unbelievable. That's not what I'm saying at all. But those stories are a great guide, a great example, a, a great inspiration, and an indication that it is possible to do something that would feel unbelievable or unlikely given a certain time period and the norms and expectations and culture of the time. Yes, it is more work. Yes, you have to be more creative to come up with a way for a fictional character to be able to defy the odds in that way, but it is possible to come up with ways to say, okay, this is what existed at the time. These would have been the laws. These would have been the norms. These would have been the beliefs. This is what, this is how people would have thought and behaved about whatever issues um, at the time. So if my character based on that, would not have been allowed, would not have been, um, it would not have been kindly looked upon, would not have had access to, etc. these things. How might a person in that time period have gone about, you know, working around that, or evading it, or confronting it, or what might need to be in place for them to be able to do so? 
can that be part of my fantasy where it is specifically a magical element that enables them to overcome this historically, you know, patriarchal setup or something like that? Do they use magic to shapeshift into a masculine looking person so that they can pretend to be a man when they need to? You know, there's there's things you can do, especially if you're writing fantasy. And yes, again, this is more challenging than just saying, well, I'm just gonna write a story where they can. Not thinking about how it might have, what they might have needed to do to do this back in the day. Just because someone didn't do this specific thing back in the day, just because we don't have a real historical example of someone being able to accomplish this, does not mean that someone could not have. So to do the thought experiment of, okay, so how might one have achieved that? How might one have defied the odds and done this? What, that's a story that I definitely want to read. That's way more interesting to me. And it takes a lot more creativity and effort to come up with a way that someone might have done that. And they could have, and they did. We have historical examples of people defying the odds. And if you are not interested in the project of thinking creatively about history in this way, about what was theoretically possible at a historical time, even if there is no example of someone doing that specific thing, I mean, why bother setting your story in a historical time period, in our world, even with you, if you add magic to it? I mean, why not just write your own secondary world where the rules are whatever you say they are, the culture is whatever you say it is. Why do this thing of saying, oh, I'm setting it in our actual 12th century Middle East, but I'm adding magic to it, but so I am attempting to recreate this historical time period per the author's note. Why do that if you have no interest in actually doing that? Because you don't have to have an interest in doing that. That's what I'd like to see. But if you're not going to be doing that, then just write a fantasy world. Why, why? Why pretend like you're interested in writing about history? Okay, so why is this book so popular? Because as far as I can tell, even though it's not been out for very long, people seem to feel that it was justly hyped, that it is great and Jacques Rabordi has done it again. Well, a lot of people like the kind of quippy shallow banter that I despise. And just look at Marvel, the numbers don't lie. A lot of people don't care about historicity. I would argue most people don't. I definitely do. That's why I said I would never have liked this book because it didn't care about that. I wouldn't have been as angry about it if it hadn't pretended to care. But again, most people just don't care. A lot of people don't mind soapboxing. I do. I don't care if I agree with it. In fact, I'll probably be more annoyed with it if I do agree with your position because I'll feel that you're doing a disservice to this argument or to this position or whatever it is. So yeah, that, that bothers me. A lot of people are not bothered by that. People apparently are not interested in, in, in nautical strategy. Again, I'm not an expert in it, but I love seeing stories that do know something about that. I really, really enjoy that. And I was hoping that if this seafaring adventure was as well researched as Shannon Chakraborty says that it was, I was looking forward to having some interesting nautical shenanigans. <laughs> and I think people are pleased by the fact that this is about a sexually liberated older Muslim woman who was a mother rather than a young cis white dude who's single and ready to mingle. And I'll give it this much, <laughs> at least this mediocre fantasy isn't by and about another white dude in a European Western inspired story. So yay for that, for the fact of that, but that doesn't, I hate a lot of mediocre white dude fantasies. So I don't think it should come as a huge surprise that I don't like this book very much. So in conclusion, people can like what they like. I'm, I'm broad, like I said, I'm broadly pleased that there is more and more diverse representation, both in terms of authorship and characters in stories in SFF. That is all to the good. When it comes to books, I am in the minority on most things. There are plenty of extremely popular and beloved books that I hate. But if the book had wanted to please specifically me, there are some things it could have done. It could have made Amina 12 years old, take out any references to sex, and to make the daughter uh, a little sister or something like that, and just make this book a middle grade adventure and basically change nothing about it, except for references to sex in the age of the character. I think it, I would have disliked it a lot less, and the juvenile nature of the banter and the characters and the simplicity of things would bother me less if I was like, oh, but this is middle grade. Um, or it could have made a greater effort to recreate this historical era and to come up with ways for Amina's existence as an independent woman and as a pirate at this time to be believable. We would have seen, you know, her earn her reputation before our eyes. So this badassery that of hers that we would really see that we'd witness that. Uh, come to the conclusion ourselves that she's a badass, or leave the book pretty much as is, but take out the quippy juvenile banter and set it in a secondary world. Don't pretend that this is a fantastical version of a real 
historical time and place in our real world. Just make it a fantasy world, take out the banter, and leave it pretty much as is, and I'd be okay-ish with it. But if we've learned nothing else, surely we've learned that my tastes are not a good indication of majority opinion. So it's probably wise for an author to not concern themselves with what would please me if they want to be commercially successful. But have you read The Adventures of Amina al Sarafi? Did you enjoy it? Did you dislike it? Did you hate it? Did you, is it your new favorite? Whatever you'll let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, Saturdays, so I can subscribe to my Patreon if you feel so inclined. And I'll see you when I see you.